Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the uh, HPNet webinar today. This is the Hydro Empowerment Network. Um, and I realize some of you are just coming into the room right now. So welcome everybody. Um, Hydro Empowerment Network's webinar, and this is on mini grid reliability, the role of training centers for micro and mini hydropower. Um, and this is the first of their 2019 webinar series. So we'd really like to welcome you to this and thank you for your enthusiastic response to it. Um, and this is part of a series. So if we can advance to the next slide, this is a part of the series for 2019. The next webinar will actually be in June. Um, on mini grid sustainability, transitioning to enterprise based micro hydropower. Um, the third one will be this autumn on mini grid financing, especially the role of local banks. And webinar four will be in December 2019, um, and that will be on mini grid planning, data mapping tools for multi actors. But for today, we're going to focus on mini grid reliability and the role of training centers for mi micro and mini hydropower. And we have some excellent speakers for you today. Um, I'm going to be joined by Mr. Lanz Habla of HPNet, um, Ms. Jade Angelau, who's of the CBOT Center for Renewable Energy, and as well, Mr. Gerhard. Fisher, who is based in Indonesia at the ASEAN Hydropower Competence Center. So we'd like to thank especially uh, the partners of this HPNet webinar, including Visions. Um, Visions, you can learn more about them at visions.net. Um, and Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I was just correcting a, a small audio problem there on my end. Um, so visions.net and visions promotes the transition to sustainable energy systems in the global south. Its mission is to empower individuals and communities to transform the production and use of energy so that it, it effectively enables sustainable development. So thank you visions for your generous support of the webinar today. And in addition to Visions, we have um, Energypedia as a partner. And Energypedia is a nonprofit organization that runs and maintains the wiki based platform Energypedia.info. So please go to their website if you'd like more information. It's an online platform for collaborative knowledge exchange on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy access in the context of development cooperation. So thank you to, to both of those uh, generous partners for, um, for supporting today's HPNet webinar on training centers. Um, so I think what I'd like to do first is go to, um, go to Lance Habla, um, who works for HPNet. Hi, Lance, are you there? Oh, uh, hello, Miss Molly. Hello, yes. yes. Hi, how are you? Uh, yes, doing fine. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, is my audio clear? Yes, your audio is clear and you're welcome to um, to begin your, your presentation. Okay. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar. So uh, before we go to our uh, speakers who will share about their local centers in depth, I would just like to provide a brief background on HPNet and our work with micro hydropower. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page and uh, as well for the benefit of those in the audience who are new who are new to the subject or the sector. So here we have an illustration of a typical micro hydropower system. So the way it, uh, micro hydropower systems work, like most common energy generation technologies, is to use a turbine to run a generator. So with MHP, we divert a portion of the flow of a river or a stream and then convey it to a turbine at a lower elevation. So the power that can be generated is then uh, proportional to the flow and the elevation between the turbine and the intake. So MHP systems can also be either standalone or grid connected and it can power a wide range, a wide variety of appliances and uh, potential end uses. And another important thing to note is that 
an, an important component in micro hydropower systems, which is also overlooked sometimes, is the watershed. You know? So without uh, without water, uh, we wouldn't have the uh, capacity to generate the electricity. So micro hydropower is proven, and it is very well past the development stage. It can deliver cheap, stable, and reliable energy 24 hours a day. Yet there remains much opportunity for improvement. And fortunately, microhydropower professionals and practitioners globally are very active in developing the solutions and innovations to address these challenges. So HPNet's mission is really to accelerate and advance these uh, innovations, be they technologies or in the form of policies, uh, which are all geared towards sustainable development of rural communities. And we do this by performing these three interrelated roles. So first is uh, the knowledge exchange. We design activities, events, that make sure the right people get the right information. So this would entail network gatherings, workshops and trainings, and e-discussions like this webinar. So a good example would be our work with open source technologies, which is also supported by Visions. And uh, more, more about that can be found in our website. So similarly with uh, strategic advocacy, uh, we provide a platform and the tools needed for multi-stakeholders to voice their concerns or share their knowledge. And thirdly, we collaborate with partners to identify important thematic focus areas that are relative, uh, relevant to the times. So this is all centered around uh, the idea that the well-documented and proven idea that renewable energy, particularly micro hydropower, can be a catalyst for an all-inclusive development that addresses cross-cutting issues such as poverty, environmental sustainability, social and gender inclusivity, among others. So international groups have recognized this as early as in the 1990s. You know, uh, like groups like ITDG and SCAT uh, supported and provided regional and in-country trainings on micro hydropower. And these trainings were very frequent and comprehensive in the sense that substantial practical hands-on activities were done in the field. The trainings were also done in multiple phases. And this resulted in uh, building a great pool of local technical talent. So here we have a picture of uh, one of our speakers, uh, Senator Lasimbang, as well as uh, an expert in Indonesia, Mr. Kus Raharjo. So it is also worth noting that behind these events were international experts like uh, Mr. Adam Harvey, who displayed sustain, uh, sustained commitment to cultivating local experts, as well as the trainees themselves who committed to continuously build on the knowledge they gained. So, for example, we have uh, uh, we have yes, we have Senator Lazimbang, and uh, to his to his left is Engineer Nazario Kakayan, who is based in Philippines and who has worked with Yamog Renewable Energy Incorporated in Mindanao with community-based renewable energy systems for over 20 years. So these are just some of the organizations who made it all possible. We have ITDG, we have SCAT, Hydronet, and of course, it's important to note their local counterparts. So AAPC in Nepal, AKRSP in Pakistan, and others. So fast forward decades later, you know, these kinds of trainings are very rare, but thankfully they spurred, they were able to spur a period of technical advancement that really led to the formation of the centers that we have featured today, among others, as well as the dynamic people who manage them. So we have Create Sibat in the Philippines. We have uh, Tony Bong Create in Malaysia, and of course, HICOM in Indonesia. And 
to end this introduction, I would just like to leave a message, a short message, you know, that this is why we always, we at HPNet, always push for knowledge exchange and trainings. So, you know, the impacts of two or three week trainings may not be immediately visible right after the activity. But if they are implemented properly and with sustained mentoring, they will be evident several times over in the work of numerous others who gained, who were able to gain the, no the knowledge they needed and the inspiration in that activity. So uh, thank you, and uh, I'm turning it over to uh, Ms. Molly. Thank you so much, Lance. Thank you for that that fascinating history to kind of get the whole audience up to speed on on the fact that this has been going on for a long time. You know, this is not something new and it's not something that happened overnight, but there's a real history there. So thank you. Um, so what I'd like yes. to do next um, is to go directly to our next speaker. So um, Jade, I'm just going to send you through a request to share your screen. And as the audience can see, that's that's Jade Angalau at CBAT. So she's going to be our next speaker. So I'll just send that through to you. And while I'm doing that, I just want to remind the audience also um, to please send in your questions during the webinar. Uh, we'd really like to hear from you and we'd like to know what questions you have um, as we go through uh, each of the speakers. So hi, Jade, are you there on the line? Let me unmute you, sorry, you're muted from my end. Hi, Jade, <laughs> how are you? Hello, Molly. I'm Hello. ready. Oh, great, great. So it's just, your screen is just coming up. Okay, I see it's full screen here. So I can see your notes. So you might want to just um, click on the full screen button. And like that, the audience will be able to see your slideshow. Perfect. So thank you so much for, for being here with us, Jade. Um, I, I know you're going to talk to us about Createch and what you guys are doing in the Philippines to help uh, enable sustainable energy access for the rural poor. So um, we, we're very much interested in hearing about what you guys have been doing there in the Philippines and sharing that with the audience. So I will invite you now to, to please um, begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Molly. Thank you very much for inviting Sibat for this webinar. Good evening, everyone. To start with, I will introduce to you a brief history of the center for RE and appropriate technology so that you have a better idea about the center. Tech is a facility to enable sustainable energy access to the Philippines rural poor. The center situated at Mangarita Organic Farm, a center for sustainable agriculture established on 2006 by CBAT. Tech was established by CBAT on 2014 as the Technology and Skills Development Hub for Seabreast. The two centers situated in Capas, Tarlac, two to three hours drive from Manila. So the vision of Createch to enable sustainable energy access to poor rural communities in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there are about 30% rural households without access to sustainable energy in the off-grid barangays and where there is grid extension that is not able to reach target barangays, villages, and households. Molly, hello? Hello. Hello, yes. Are you having trouble moving to the next slide? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, normally, if you can use the cursor keys on your keyboard, it should allow you to, to go forward. Um, yes, I go forward. I use it already, but I think there's a problem with this. But it's OK. Um, if, if you're not able to resolve it, um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll run them from my computer. It's not a problem. Shall we do that? Yes, yes, of course. OK, OK. So it, audience, if you just bear with me for one second, I'm just going to um, uh, to switch over to my 
my other computer and run the slides from there. So just take one second here. Okay. Okay, let me just make that full screen. And there's a tiny, tiny delay sometimes on my end. So Jade, they're almost up there. Let me go ahead and put that as well. Run those for you and uh, that should be fine. Okay, um, so Jade, let me just, um, let me just move forward in your sides a little bit and Okay, so I'm on the slide now. Um, obje objectives of Create Tech. Is that yes, good? Yes, thank you, Ms. Molly. Thank you. Okay. Yes. No problem. Okay. Uh, the objectives of Create Tech is to promote an advanced community based RE system in the Philippines. Next. Its, it's specific objectives are. One, provide knowledge on CBS through training of, of community members. Two, to provide information and advisory to communities in response to their request for sustainable energy. Third, to assist CBAT skill team in installing the system. Fourth, provide technical monitoring to systems and address the concerns as required. And lastly, to conduct research and innovation on small equipment to improve efficiency of system. Next slide, please. Create, create a facility. So inside the create a machine uh, center, we have late machine, drilling and milling machine, welding machine, ELC manufacturing unit, a training room for research and development, a small library and small office to accommodate client and serve as a meeting place of the program and various other tools and also a productive and efficient uh, machine. We also conduct trainings such as publication and troubleshooting troubleshooting training to local technicians, microhydro turbines, and electronic load controllers. We do also operation and maintenance training to village level operators, basic theory of microhydro power system and practical, preventive maintenance on site and actual operation of the system, training and retraining during repairs and upgrading. Next, organizational and financial training to village level project managers. These are being given during and upon commissioning of the system. Facilitation of policy formulation, organizational development and bookkeeping. Orientation and awareness training to local government units. The breast concept and design for communities, roles of LGUs to assist the breast development. Okay. We do also institutional training. Two exchange type of organizational and finance trainings were held since 2015. The best representatives were gathered to share and exchange about their organizational experiences and problems. Among them were CBRS with more advanced experiences and provided the leading insights to improve on organizational methods. So about 16 CBRS organizations had attended this exchange type of training. So we have here the photo with the participants and together with the technical staff of CBRS. Next. We conducted also a microhydro operators training. Four exchange type of operator trainings were held since 2015. 
operators were gathered to exchange about their O&M experiences and problems and were given the needed input. About 70 operators attended the exchange type of trainings for CBRES project. Other partners in institution wishing to adopt CBRES brought their partner communities to the center to acquire theoretical and practical training. We have the photos um, taken during, during the on-site practicum together with CBAT technical people and also the CBRES partners organization. Next. Impact of creative training and research and innovation. Okay. Um, it reduces MHP downtime and dependence. Second, improve management and organizational capacity. Increase efficiency of system performance. Accelerate deployment of MHP system. Create a multi-stakeholder approach to knowledge exchange. So, create manufacturers efficient agricultural equipment that are appropriate to the conditions of small upland communities and that are not available in the market. Create host foreign volunteers annually to help in the more advanced aspects of the work, such as wind system and in the more complicated aspect of microhydropower development. Create a host local students on the job trainings to prepare them for engineering careers, giving importance on CBRES development. Create a conduct meetings with LGUs to capacitate the government from Barangay municipal up to national levels by way of pursuing CBRS advocacy to help us fund ongoing rehab and upgrading activities of the center. These are the photos taken during the on-site practicum and during the orientation of the community-based renewable energy system. Together with the technical staff of CBAT, and also the volunteer of CBAT and also the community. Thus, CREATEC serves a facilitative and catalyzing role in pursuing CBRES development. Thank you. If you need more information, please uh, visit uh, CBAT website or cbat-e.org. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Molly. Oh, thank you, Ms. Jade. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, that was a real pleasure to, to also to see all of those photos. Um, I, I know that's one of the most um, nice things to see is, is because so much of the, the training and the capacity building is really about people. So thank you for those, those lovely photos of everyone. Um, so let me um, move to our next speaker. So what I'm going to do is, as mentioned, our next speaker is um, Mr. Gerhard Fischer. Um, we are joined by our third speaker um, who had had some technical difficulties, um, and he will he will come in just after um, Mr. Fischer speaks. Um, so that will be Adrian Bonnie Lassenbang. Um, but next up, we will go to Gerhard. Um, hi, Gerhard. Are you there on the line? Yeah, OK. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So just that you can and uh, your screen. And let me show my screen now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just let me try to uh, move the screen here now. I cannot mm -hmm. remove that thing here. Ah, uh, in the way now. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh. And if you just go to your um, opening slide, to your okay. cover slide, I think that way. Is, can you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's on your. I think it's on your third side. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So now, thank you. 
Yeah, I can see it very well. Okay, so yes, uh, so good evening everybody and of course thanks for inviting me as well. Far from Bandung, we are scattered all over the world, that's very amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to speak about HICOM and maybe technology transfer in the last say almost 20 years in Indonesia. And uh, so maybe first, if uh, no, does it work now? Huh? What's that now? So you should be able to uh, advance your slides with your your cursor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I have it. Yeah. Okay, uh, HICOM is, uh, we call it ASEAN Hydropower Competence Center, is also giving training and one big part is experience exchange and networking and possibly also developing and research a bit for the small hydropower sector. Um, HICOM was established in about 2011 after <laughs> quite some time of constructing it. Yeah. And basically, it's based on the hydro laboratory equipment from University for Technica in Zurich, Switzerland. They somehow uh, stopped the equipment and offered us to bring it to Bandung, Indonesia. And uh, we were supported from Swiss government, from REPIC. Yeah? It's like a renewable energy platform for the shipping costs. And we had a private public partnership with ASEAN Center of Energy and GIZ, the German International Corporation, funding some construction costs. Then uh, we work together with TDC, the Technical Education and Development Center for uh, Vocational School Training, uh, also called Long Name Indonesian. Yeah? And they provided the uh, land on their compound and also support the administration. And Entec AG and PT Entec is basically a Swiss company, and we are the Indonesian uh, daughter company. We did the design, implementation, and uh, construction of this thing. So after installation, GIZ uh, somehow supported an integrated expert to establish HICOM for three years, which was myself. Huh? So that how the uh, HICOM was established, and. Uh, now, HICOM is operated as a private-public partnership uh, based on an MOU. Uh, we have a consortium, which is TDC. It's a government institution to train vocational teachers and to make a curriculum for this uh, training. It's in Bandung and PTNTEC Indonesia. We are a local company in Indonesia. We jointly operate this uh, HICOM. Um, we have also uh, target groups, <laughs> funny name, huh? but uh, potential cover, uh, uh, customers, of course, are public and private sector actors, educational institution active in hydropower development. So we think on equipment manufacturers, suppliers and consultants, lecturers of university, vocational schools and other educational institutions. We have a mini hydropower association here and in other countries as well. We train operators and managers of hydropower plants. Also regional and national hydropower support programs, which are now in Indonesia not really focusing on hydropower anymore, but other renewable energies. Of course, political decision makers, representatives of the government departments, we are training and potential investors, financiers, also important banks uh, know about hydropower technology. So I think that is quite a lot of uh, possibilities to, to do something. Uh, one very good news, fulfilling some kind of a dream is that in last year, HICOM was upgraded uh, to a renewable energy center covering wind energy, hydro, of course, solar and bioenergy, and also waste management, like plastic waste management and organic waste. And became some kind of a, a certification body for the Indonesian government and vocational school level. It's called TUKTEC, and it's on the compound of HICOM, which was extended, and uh, so a lot of possibilities. Uh, coming to, let me say, products and services, we call it. Uh, 
Um, we have uh, somehow conducting some more standard and trainings and also tailor-made according to the request of the customers. Um, we can develop uh, core competencies and uh, qualification of teachers and trainers as uh, the ADSA is uh, training teachers and making um, curriculum uh, for vocational school education in Indonesia. This is a good uh, place. Uh. In the ADSA, there are also other capacities like civil engineering, electronic, mechanical production. So there is quite a big compound and can be synergized with our center. Um, also, um, as we said, uh, technicians can be trained, operators, also supervisors for building hydropower plants, designers. And of course, one part is. Uh, defining standards and quality assurance, accreditation and measurement to promote greater quality and efficiency in the hydropower sector. So um, maybe the question may be, how does it come to uh, build it in Bandung? Yeah, one thing was the random that we got this equipment and I was working in Bandung, so it came here. But the other reason is uh, in Bandung, in maybe beginning 1991, uh, the hydropower developing started and maybe up to now, maybe 350 people working in Bandung and outside now as well and accumulated over these 20 years uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, know-how in the sector and covering all the aspects. And uh, coming to this, long-term uh, support of technology transfer to Indonesia, which was mainly financed from uh, German government, also from NDEF, uh, Holland and World Bank and so on. We had five types of uh, activities during this time. Uh, first, the most obviously is the heart of the, of the power plant, the turbine, which is not so difficult. Uh, but difficult enough. So we started with a uh, cross flow turbine, which is very suitable for many rural electrification projects, then more complicated propeller and pelton turbines. So, so we cover everything from design to commissioning. And the next step was to improve the civil structures and somehow uh, standardize it. Then uh, develop the control systems. Also, like earlier, Nigel Swiss was uh, mentioned as a pioneer, of course, he installed uh, training here with induction generator controllers. And now we update it to electrical, uh, electro load controllers and digital controllers. Then, uh, very important, make productive use of the energy. So during a, a like quite some phase we try to develop uh, these technologies and then using uh, villages and last not least the institutional setup aspects in a hydropower plant uh, uh, just introducing a tariff system management of the plant collecting systems and all these things which are very important uh, so hydropower is a whole package of technology. And what is not mentioned is number six is the environment where we are working, like catchment area, protection, things like that. Good, that was this development. And just as some kind of a summary or an idea, uh, our statistic shows that we already produced about 1,100 turbines in Indonesia with a rated output of about 50 megawatt within this time. And quite a number of equipment was already exported all over the world, starting from Switzerland to South Africa. Um, you see here the typical development of a technology. So it started very slow, very slow in 2004. The subsidy was removed on the fossil fuel. The conditions for hydropower became better. And then the market was ready to, to boom or to produce more and more uh, turbines and equipment. 
Unfortunately, now there is a little bit uh, flattening because photovoltaics and other renewable energies uh, are in many cases also very good. And controllers, a similar picture. We have uh, about two main manufacturers in Bandung where I found the data. Is Renault Consis is about 1,040 controllers and all installed 40 megawatt and PMA and other companies about 700 controllers and about 10 megawatt. Um, so the trainings uh, have quite a long tradition in, in Indonesia. And uh, when I first came to Indonesia, this was a waterfall I have seen. And I said, as a target, there must be a power plant. And at the development, there is now a power plant. But this tradition started much earlier, as uh, Lance already mentioned. Huh? We had uh, in, in the 80s, we had a mini hydro power group, huh? which was from IDGG, Fax, CART, GAY, GIZ and was some kind of a network like HPNet working some years. And so many trainings were made in Nepal, Philippines, Switzerland, using university and hydro lab centers like we had. And I think that was a real uh, good input. And we can see that still today. And here you see some trainings in Switzerland, seeing big power plants, small power plants, going in a hydro lab, learning a bit bottom down engineering. That was four weeks, very dense trainings, and I think they had a big effect. So uh, this know-how somehow makes sense to shift it where it's needed. Yeah? In Europe, the hydropower is developed. It's just rehabilitation and so on. But in Asian, African countries, Latin America, this is some kind of a booming technology and uh, can uh, be very good. So it makes a lot of sense to bring this equipment to Bandung, what we could manage. So we, we implemented it in Bandung. These are like uh, Pelton, Francis turbines, which have been used to develop turbines maybe 50 years ago. Uh, so big turbines were based on these model testings. And we have a synchronizing unit. So the uh, ELC can be connected uh, to the grid and we can study the performance during being grid connected. Then we have a simulation of a uh, um, uh, cross flow turbine. So the operators can dismantle it, can operate it, change the belts, and somehow study the behavior, also seeing the characteristics. And uh, there is ELC load controller simulation board. So we also so uh, have this. Um, so the impact maybe is uh, strengthening the hydropower sector and associations worldwide. Then we have international networking and experience exchange, which I really think is very important. Huh? Then we have improving feasibility studies, design of hydropowers, improving operation by operator trainings, and supporting maybe the implementation of hydropower standards. Uh, initiating renewable energy introduction and certification on vocational school sector, which I think is also good. Uh, supporting expertise to set up national hydropower standards, SNE, and preparing uh, the ground for renewable energy center within TDC, which happened on the end. So we had about 500 visitors all over the time uh, from all over the world visiting this center. And uh, we try to make also offering tailor-made uh, training packages. And about 300 pay, uh, participants from about 27, 25 lenders participated uh, in the workshop and trainings. So here is an example of a hydropower network meeting, uh, the second one. So some of you may know this end already. Another example was this HPNet ELC uh, operation and troubleshooting training uh, in two years ago. So, and uh, yeah, you see, we have seminar rooms, manufacturer can offer some hands-on uh, experience as well. 
these are some examples of modules we prepared and we can combine. So it's introduction, management of hydropower projects, development, operation, maintenance, site identification and feasibility study and equipment uh, fabrication trainings. <clears throat> so still, I'm convinced that MHP technology is also in many cases a good thing to support rural development. That's uh, the end of my presentation. You can contact me or ICOM if you like. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, promote Hydropower, the center, HPNet. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And just so everybody notices there, um, your website is highcom.info. So thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Gerhard, for describing this, this history of HICOM. It's really, really impressive. Um, I won't say much more, but just to say uh, congratulations on being upgraded to a renewable energy center and certification body for the Indonesian government. Um, that's a really mm -hmm. big deal, I know. So uh, congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, yeah, um, we have our um, our next speaker, uh, which is Senator Adrian Bani Lassenbang. And let me just bring you off of mute. Hi. Hi, Hi. Me? Great. Yes, Great. Wonderful. Well, we're so glad you were able to to join us. We know there were some technical challenges, um, so that's a nice surprise. Um, so what I'm going to do is send you through a request to share your screen, and that way we can then um, see see your slides. Okay. Okay. And if you just bring that to full screen, I know there's a little delay sometimes. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, and just a, a very brief intro, um, since I didn't get to introduce you at the very beginning, um, but just to mention um, that the Honorable Adrian Bonnie Lassenbang has been um, became a senator for the national government of Malaysia, representing the state of Sabah, um, and that you're going to talk to us to, today about the work of Tony Bung and the role of training centers for community empowerment. So, with that, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, first, first of all, I apologize for my slight delay because I was. Uh, having some technical problem when I was coming back uh, from my site visit just now. Anyway, I'm very glad to be part of this webinar and um, I'd like to share uh, a little bit of experiences. Uh, Tony Bong, our organization, uh, have um, to do with uh, you know community empowerment and also introduce to you our training center, which is, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit later. So, First of all, I'd like to introduce our organization. Um, Tony Bung in, uh, is based, basically established in 1998. Uh, used, uh, used to be a youth organization in my uh, community, and we came together to promote um, you know, renewable energy and other appropriate technologies to uh, various indigenous communities, uh, specifically very remote areas in the Sabah Borneo region. Um, we have been doing a lot of uh, stuff do, uh, related to microhydro, um, photovoltaics, uh, solar thermal, and also looking at various uh, appropriate technologies that might be useful for the communities, uh, like biogas and also biomass. Um, we have been doing this for the last uh, 20 years, uh, mainly to work on empowering the communities in terms of managing their natural resources, and also build the, uh, the socioeconomy within the communities with the available power. Um, a lot of us discuss about uh, productive end use from energy, from this uh, community-based renewable energy systems, and uh, we have been focusing particularly on that. Um, we have been partnering with a lot of other organizations. I'm very glad um, presentation from Gerhard just now because we have uh, actually worked together with various uh, players from the microhydro um, uh, companies uh, from Bandung and uh, have provided us a lot of the initial support uh, when we are doing this work. Um, our main uh, mission and focus uh, is to look at how we can uh, provide uh, 
access to clean water, uh, electricity to renewable energy and other sustainable solutions. And we focus on how to integrate projects um, within the communities, uh, particularly in terms of uh, you know, uh, renewable energy into uh, sustainable agriculture, watershed management, and so on, uh, so that it can have a sustainable impact over time. And hopefully we can also uh, empower the communities in terms of managing their resources. So here I can just show you uh, some of our activities. Uh, we're looking at uh, fabrication of uh, turbines. Uh, we also do a lot of supervising in terms of um, uh, uh, construction of the micro hydro systems and also how to train the community operators and when we have this system uh, in place. So uh, we run a, a center called uh, CREATE, a Center for Renewable Energy and Appropriate Technologies. Um, and uh, it was uh, initiated uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago uh, when we had a partnership with Green Empowerment and we got the uh, initial funding from the National Geographic uh, and the Great Energy Challenge. So from that in initial um, funding that we got, we managed to acquire um, some funds to develop uh, community-based modules on how to train our technicians on surveying uh, to fabrication and also operation and maintenance. And this is very important because we want to make sure that uh, whatever uh, systems or project that we implement in the communities uh, can be sustained over time uh, so that they have the, a certain level of competency in terms of managing and also operating the systems. Um, a lot of the projects uh, that we can see fail because uh, there are lack of uh, you know, um, empowerment uh, of the communities to manage uh, those systems. So we have been focusing uh, exactly on that. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, uh, have been establishing community organizing trainings uh, through other partnership uh, with various NGOs uh, in Sabah and in, in general in Malaysia. Our center um, is not is located uh, not far from the uh, city center from Kota Kinabalu, uh, about 15, 15 minutes drive to center. We have a hostel um, and a workshop facility where we can fabricate uh, components of turbines and also uh, have uh, play, uh, the, uh, uh, equipment for, for the trainees that uh, come and train in our center. Um, we provide uh, two, two types of training. One is just for the op operators, uh, which normally we provide uh, one uh, whole week uh, training course on uh, how to maintain and operate uh, the different types of turbines that we install, uh, how to do uh, troubleshooting and, and, and so on. Uh, and these are mainly uh, dedicated for uh, community operators, uh, every project that we, we do. The second type of training is um, a much more long term. Uh, it's a six month training program. Um, this is intended to provide um, community uh, technicians and also uh, those who are willing or who want to be uh, developing projects. So we give them training the basics of micro hydro, how to do surveying, the design, and, and so on. Um, so that uh, when they want to uh, establish a project, they can basically know how to do the proper um, da call data collection and make, making sense of the data to design those uh, particular project. Um, and then they can uh, basically use that to do fundraising, uh, to get funding from different donor agencies. Um, we have been trying to do a lot of experimenting on our side um, thanks to uh, HPNet because a uh, few of our, our staff have uh, had the opportunity to uh, go and uh, have some learning from Sri Lanka and also uh, went to I think Nepal if I'm not mistaken and from that on we uh, can see the, the, the different uh, ways of doing things and uh, those experience they go uh, bring back and we also tried our own um, uh, experimenting uh, on providing this. For example, like uh, 
some of our uh, guys that went to do training in Janataksan in Sri Lanka, they, they are very impressed with how, um, you know, for, for making um, recycled aluminum uh, from any cans to make turbine uh, casting. So uh, from a lot of watching YouTubes and <laughs> exchanges and uh, we managed to basically train few of our guys to be able to do casting um, and further improve some of those designs that we acquired pro from the previous um, uh, you know, exchange program. So now we are uh, also training our local youths, uh, our uh, indigenous youths to also uh, have the possibility of um, yeah, making these turbine components and we buy it from them. Um, we create some small enterprise uh, from, from that and hopefully we can uh, have, uh, you know, sustain certain uh, business so that uh, they, if, if, even if the, um, you know, the component, uh, they, there's a lot of also wear and tear in the, in the, for example, the Pelton turbine. So maybe down the road, they need to change those uh, Pelton wheels. They can basically buy from those guys who can make this. So uh, we have been doing a lot of other testing. Uh, of course, we have been the, uh, the exchange program, uh, we try and see how uh, we can also share what we have learned from the exchange program and see whether we can further improve that. Um, we are also looking uh, further uh, because the market for uh, the sites for micro hydro is becoming less and less. Uh, so, and also there's a lot of competition within the solar PVs. But we found that there are actually a lot of possibilities in uh, looking at hybrid systems uh, like solar hydro hybrids. So we have been experimenting and uh, conducting different uh, uh, pilot projects on this. Uh, we have done at least seven communities on solar hydro hybrid. And um, this is to basically uh, power social economy centers to encourage also uh, productive and use of energy. Um, uh, we are also looking at uh, how to make uh, the technology of, um, uh, accessible because if you look at the SDG goal, we want to look at affordable uh, energy system. So, of course, we we are not trying to cut corners, but we are trying to see what are the di different uh, approaches that we can reduce the development cost of any MHP, um, and we are trying the, the different ways of producing this locally uh, and uh, so that it can be run by our local champions. Um, our, our main goal now is to reach the last mile uh, and also to empower the youths. Normally, these uh, last mile communities are very remote areas and they will not have um, opportunity to get uh, government uh, you know, projects. Uh, because um, they are too far. So we are looking at uh, focusing on remote communities uh, within, especially in the, the Borneo, uh, the Malaysian Borneo side um, of, of the country. Um, we are looking at uh, organizing in-situ training. Apart from organizing the trainings in our center, we also go to communities and um, conduct uh, basic microhydro training, how to do surveying, and also looking at how to um, involve the communities uh, in terms of decision making and designing the, the projects. Um, we have been extensively promoting the community-based model, um, uh, and then we are looking at how to make sure that the uh, uh, community is uh, in the steering wheel, uh, the, the driving seat of any projects that is being done in the communities. So uh, these are some of the just example of uh, why we are uh, working on towards um, uh, pushing this community-based mo community model. Recently, after my appointment as senator, we have been I have been pushing this uh, to our gov government so that the, um, this uh, alternative approach can also be uh, used by the government programs uh, so that communities can have and own uh, their own uh, uh, energy systems in the community. Um, we are looking at a lot of things uh, apart from 
looking at the technology. Um, we are looking at how to make sure that the community's uh, involvement in every project is been um, op optimized. And uh, from my uh, experience over 20 years, um, in fact, microhydro, <laughs> I can fairly say 80% is actually social engineering because uh, it involves a lot of community organizing um, and pre-project planning in the, in, the, in the early stage. And uh, the implementation is actually just 20% of it. And another whole uh, uh, you know, batch of uh, resources is needed to, uh, to help the communities. A lot of hand-holding, actually, uh, even after the project had been uh, successfully completed. So um, our approach also to look at how to fund um, these projects, uh, looking at utilizing um, conservation funds to uh, basically fund these um, uh, pro micro hydro projects. Um, in Malaysia, we are uh, quite a bit difficult to get uh, aid agencies to fund projects because uh, you know Malaysia is already considered to be a middle income country. And um, this is a big challenge for us because uh, normally we are not um, eligible to, uh, to apply for uh, development funds. So in that, uh, in our case, we are looking at um, using conservation funds, applying for conservation funds to to fund this uh, micro hydro project. So it's that, that is the financing mechanism that we have been ap approaching, um, like uh, pay payment of ecosystem services, uh, RDD, Red Plus, and and so on, because we tie uh, the uh, micro hydro projects uh, with uh, watershed conservation. Um, and we want to make sure that the community is committed towards managing those watershed. So it all involves a lot more than just uh, technology. It's, they uh, create a lot of um, other uh, work like community mapping um, and also community engagement in terms of how to uh, to draw uh, to to uh, finalize the community watershed protocols. Um, the, the last thing I want to share is how important it is to integrate uh, women's uh, empowerment in the, in, the, in the program because uh, we see that um, no, uh, most of our projects uh, is not uh, free. Uh, the com community is required to pay back certain amount of money or funds to, to, to our revolving fund. So one way for them to be able to do this is to uh, organize um, like uh, socioeconomic centers and um, for the income from this center can basically uh, include to, to um, pay the, some of the components uh, to our revolving fund. So these are the kind of things that we also do in our center to look at what are different approaches uh, on um, making this accessible to the communities. Um, I've talked about this solar hybrid system, uh, and I think we are still in the um, testing. Uh, the first project that uh, we installed is already about five years now, so uh, not that uh, I think that you, you're going to expect some problems with the batteries soon. So we are looking at how to make sure that the uh, system can be um, maintained or uh, how we can um, get money, enough money to pay for the new sets of um, Also, we are looking at um, setting up more uh, microgrid systems uh, by integrating two or more uh, micro hydro systems to, into one renewable energy grid. So we are looking at this uh, approach and we are actually doing one uh, pilot projects uh, which is going to be completed somewhere in June or July this year. Um, so uh, to conclude, uh, the training programs, I think uh, it's very important to increase the pool of competent community technicians, which is very important um, to create job opportunities within the communities. Uh, and also uh, we have a center to develop local, locally brewed technologies and uh, work uh, on other appropriate technology apart from microhydro. We are also looking at how to uh, 
um, work on the different appropriate technologies like biogas and how maybe possibility of integrating this into community projects. Um, to have training programs, it opens up the possibility of exchange programs because we have uh, our niche. Uh, so this we can be shared within uh, our different partners within the region and, and so on. Uh, and with example, we've already uh, done a lot of this through the HP Net. And uh, I think lastly, it's very important to give the local communities the opportunity to learn uh, and maintain the community-based renewable energy system. So we, uh, without the training programs, it, it's a bit difficult to do that, to do this. So yeah, I think just to to conclude, um, we did uh, got some. Uh, uh, award for this, just looking at especially on the community-based model and uh, how uh, we uh, conduct community center design. These are some of our partners and sponsors. The last uh, few years, uh, our state government have been also get in, uh, recently getting more involved in making sure that uh, there's opportunity. But uh, again, link um, uh, with corporate agencies and and so on is. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this way we can do the uh, project more uh, okay so I think that's all um, thank you very much uh, so I'll be happy to uh, answer if there's any questions so this is my uh, contact number and um, yeah, happy to share if you uh, uh, anything else we can thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Lassenbeng. Thank you for sharing that presentation with us. Um, and uh, it, it was particularly notable just, uh, we'll have a proper discussion, but just to mention it, it's very interesting that you mentioned that the important role of young people and of women um, in your presentation and, and also the role of the community-based model. Um, and, and again, to kind of go back to Jade's presentation, the the 80 percent of community organizing that that really stands out to me um, the the people aspect that comes across in all of your presentations really so thank you very much for that um, so what we'll do now just before I go to Lance so Lance if you hold on just a second I'm going to do a couple of quick audience polls um, just to know a little bit about our audience and also just to see um, what they're thinking about um, in relation to these topics so let me just launch that poll so if everybody if you don't mind going and voting and letting us know what type of stakeholder do you represent? Are you working maybe for a nonprofit or an NGO? Are you working for the private sector? Maybe you're actually working for the government or a funding agency. Um, perhaps you're a researcher or maybe you're working um, as part of a network of uh, perhaps of energy practitioners um, as we all know. Um, so Thanks a lot for voting, everybody. I'm not sure, has everybody voted? I'll give you just a couple more seconds. And just a little reminder here as well to keep sending in your questions. I see we've gotten quite a few. Um, do keep sending those in, and we're going to circle back around to those in the Q&A session coming up in just a moment. Um, just after Lance's uh, discussant presentation. Um, and I also just wanted to mention to you all that um, behind the scenes, now maybe she'll be a bit embarrassed that I'm saying this, but behind the scenes there is a woman named Dipti Vagela who is the coordinator of HPNet um, and uh, who is working very much on these issues. She's really been, um, she along with Lance have really been the driving force for getting the whole webinar together today. So I did just want to acknowledge that um, and I think everybody has voted now. So let me go ahead and share those poll results with you. Okay. So I'm going to share that. Okay. So we see we've got about 19% working for NGOs, about 34% in the private sector, 16% in funding agencies, and 31% who are researchers. And I know we have 0% for networks, but I think it's probably because people couldn't choose both options because I know we have quite a lot of, of network representatives here today. So, okay, what I'm going to do is another very, very quick poll, and this is just about micro hydropower. So let me launch that for you. So what interests you most about micro hydropower? Is that building local skills? Is it maybe technology advancement? Policy and financing for micro hydro like we were just hearing about? Um, or maybe also the environmental benefits and watershed protection? 
So let me get, just let you guys go ahead and vote on that. Okay, so I think I think most people have voted. Let me share that with you guys so that you can see um, see what all of you think is important when it comes to micro hydropower. Okay, so we have 24% of you saying building local skills, 31% technology advancement, policy and financing also at 31%, and environmental benefits and watershed protection at 14%. But that's very interesting because we were just hearing in the presentations how important building local skills um, is for micro hydropower. So that's interesting. So maybe we'll have a little think about that um, and come back to that in the Q&A. Okay. So let me um, let me go over to uh, back over to Lands, who's going to be our discussant. Hi, Lands, are you there on the line? Ah, uh, yes, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Hi, yeah. Lands. Um, so I I wanted you to um, to let us uh, oh, yeah. help us connect up all of these presentations that we've heard they're oh, all yeah. in different countries doing slightly different things but they're all training centers so um if you can help the audience kind of link up some of these important points that we've been hearing and um and bring out some of the things that that you guys in hpnet find especially important yeah sure of course um is are, are the slides showing um not yet um let's see did you you have already accepted the um, the um, link that uh, I sent there. Um, Sometimes it gets minimized. Uh, not yet. Okay, let me um, let me just bring that back to myself for one second, and then what I will do is make you the presenter again. That should come should come through to you now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Great. Okay, so uh, really I would like to thank everyone, the audience, for being with us to listen and the speakers particularly for sharing their experiences. So uh, as I see it, all three centers were really able to develop their facilities and develop their uh, curriculum to cater perfectly to the needs of their, uh, their own localities. Also for Malaysia, we have we have a special focus on uh, the indigenous movement for all types of renewable energy. So the transition from imported to indigenous technology is was very uh, emphasized. And uh, because of the center, we have longer lived projects and the ability to rehabilitate uh, projects that have gone through much wear and tear. Uh, and similarly with the Philippines, you know, there's the emphasis on being able to locally manufacture, which is very important since this drives down the cost of the renewable of the community community based re renewable energy systems, and this in turn uh, increases the uh, sustainability of the project. So we also have training for the multi actors, uh, being able to engage with uh, the local government units in the Philippines especially is an important thing uh, since uh, uh, a lot of projects are uh, dictated by uh, the policies of the government. And we have uh, design and fabrication of productive end use machinery, which likewise increases the sustainability, economic sustainability of a project by uh, increasing the income of the communities and, and uh, uh, improving their uh, ability to engage in productive ventures. So with uh, HICOM, we have uh, a very, very important emphasis on their capability to and their being a pioneer in the region for knowledge transfer. So HICOM has been a very instrumental uh, entity in disseminating uh, the technology for microhydro and uh, other renewable energy systems now to uh, to a lot of other countries and to other partners. 
So, uh, so I'm also very. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate Taikom for uh, being the being for upgrading themselves to the 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 new the new center for with the certification from the government. No? And also, I'd like to really also re reiterate on the social aspect of micro hydropower projects. Now, I really relate to what Senator Bonnie said about micro hydropower projects, renewable energy projects, community-based projects, really being 80% social engineering. And this is something that I have also experienced uh, in my, uh, I have, I've seen in my humble experience. So the common tr common thrust uh, with all of the centers really is to develop the right competencies so that local actors, local communities, are able to independently independently manage or develop their projects, uh, and all in harmony with the, with the environment, all in a sustainable manner. And another one is be to be able to deploy appropriate technologies for uh, increased community empowerment and there's also the underlying uh, emphasis no, in, uh, in all of this just need uh, just needing or just having to be a sustained effort you know, knowledge transfer is not a one-shot deal and it has to be sustained you know through generations and yeah so I hope this has really provided an avenue not only for the audience to learn about our speakers, but also for our speakers to learn from uh, each other's experiences. And uh, hopefully this will lead to deeper collaborations. So uh, maybe we also have some people in the audience who are in organizations who are planning to set up their own centers. And we hope this also inspires you uh, because uh, one example of HPNet synergizing practitioners is with uh, an organization in Mindanao, Philippines with Yamog Renewable Energy Incorporated. It's a nonprofit. So through HPNet, Yamog is currently taking inspiration from these three centers and many others in set setting up, currently setting up its uh, renewable and sustainable energy technology center which will uh, focus on improving and reinforcing their work in Mindanao. So uh, we hope for the best, we hope the best for them. So uh, that's that's all from uh, Ms. Molly, back to you. Well, thank you, Lance. Thank you for, for all of those points and kind of bringing everything together for us here um, just before the, we go into the Q&A session. Um, so we do have some great audience questions here. Um, we have a couple of questions also just from our side that we had already thought about. So um, we will we will try to do a little bit of both of those in the time remaining, um, if that's okay for everybody. Um, so let me start first um, by going back to um, going back to Jade. Hi, hi Jade, are you there on the line? Hi, hi Jade. Hi. So. Yeah. Hi, great, great. So I just wanted to um, to ask a, a question um, to you. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, how did you, um, how did CBOT actually decide to transition from imported technology to micro hydro turbines that are actually built in your own center? How did you decide to make that transition? And, and also how did that, how did that go for you? Was it a, a challenging transition? Yeah, yeah. Well, Tiba uh, decided to manufacture local turbine. This was this this was a decision made in the international training held in Cebu, Philippines, in 1995, hosted by ITDG and Tiba. But before the training, Tiba already fabricated the first cross flow turbine in 1994 and installed of one of uh, the sites in 1994 and yeah and now it was the oldest uh, micro hydro in the philippines and sibat also saw the problems in importation importation such as high cost and 
rigor rigorous procedures in importation. And the cost is high. And also the important thing is uh, we, we can easily transfer the knowledge to local technician and troubleshoot the unit if there's a problem. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jade. Um, so moving right along, let me go to Gerhard next. Um, hi, Gerhard, are yeah. you there? Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Great. So uh, I want to ask you, um, do you think um, micro hydro training centers should focus on all renewable energy technologies? I know you mentioned that you guys have recently been upgraded to a renewable energy center. Or do you think there's also still a need for technology specific centers? Yeah, I think uh, the combination is very good. Yeah? Seeing the complexity of a village setup and the speciality like hydropower, uh, especially if it's not the big output, maybe you need very specific know-how to design a two megawatt fences turbine. Of course, you have to go into it. Yeah? But the hydropower has so many aspects also which are the same for other ener energies, like a uh, village setup for solar panel is not so different than from another one if you have to get the tariffs and and so on. And hyd hydropower also has the strength of connecting with the, with the environment. Yeah? So I think uh, it, some some parts are, like they are manufacturers, they manufacture reliable equipment. That is, of course, one part of it. Yeah? But uh, the hydropower is more complex. Uh, and, and the statement that uh, maybe 80% is social engineering, yeah, okay, I agree to that. But if the 20% are not good, huh, then the 80% are bigger. Huh? That means we still have to focus on the technical things. But engineers also can think uh, more for other technologies as well and, and see and decide what can be developed. Huh? I'm quite thinking it's the right way to to focus on other technologies as well. I can tell you, if, when I was starting 40 years ago, I made a study of all renewable energies available at that time. Huh? And my conclusion was hydropower is the most sophisticated and the most worth it at that time. But then one watt peak was $100. Now it's 0 0.1. Huh? So it, it has really changed. Huh? I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, next, let me go um, to Senator Bonnie. Um, here we go. Hi, are you there on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So the, the question that I wanted to ask you um, is especially about indigenous practitioners of microhydro and, and for what role you see them playing in increasing Sabah's electrification rate. Yeah, um, it, it is, I think their role is very important. Um, uh, in particular, uh, there are so many very hard to reach uh, areas uh, where indigenous peoples are living. And uh, normally the government's um, electrification uh, deals so much uh, at uh, grid, the national grid expansion and so on, which uh, will take uh, many years or almost some of these areas are very remote that is impossible or is not uh, it's not economical to bring this uh, uh, um, national grid to to the villages. So I think the role of the uh, off grid um, mini grid uh, system is very um, important in order for us to uh, have this system uh, of to electrify these remote areas. So that's why the indigenous uh, technician has to be trained um, in order for us to uh, reduce the reliance of uh, technician outside. Uh, of the uh, remote areas so that um, at least they can, um, you know, uh, have the competency to uh, do, um, you know, basic troubleshooting and so on. Of course, the, the <coughs> uh, more technical uh, competency needs to be also available um, locally, maybe in the state, uh, when there's uh, more complicated issues um, uh, that will uh, they cannot be addressed by the local technicians. So, uh, I mean, of course, we are not saying that we we are 100% totally relying on the indigenous technicians, but they are a certain level of um, competency and skills uh, they need to have uh, before um, if there is a more complicated issue uh, for the, on, on occurring on the systems, at least uh, this 
at least the state level has somebody who can uh, basically help on the troubleshooting and maybe rectify those problems. Well, and while you, while I have you here, and and while we're talking about that, we actually had an audience question um, that was. Let me just read that to you, and I think it's applicable to to yourself and and to um, Jade and Gerhard. Um, so, when developing technical training programs um, in rural areas, how do you mitigate the risk that the trained personnel um, do not move away from rural areas and go to the wealthier urban centers? Um, I know this has been a challenge for a number of, of um, people who have done these, these trainings in other situations, but for yourselves, you've been going for so long, um, you're so experienced. How, how is it that you find that people um, uh, remain there and continue to use their skills uh, to serve their communities? Uh, I think the, the most important part is um, we have to create some uh, you know, job opportunities for this uh, trained technician. Um, in our case, uh, they are actually paid a monthly um, salary to, to operate this system and those uh, uh, is actually collected from the communities from the uh, energy cells or uh, the collection tariff uh, that was the set by the communities. Um, that's one um, possible uh, you know uh, approach. The second thing is to, to create um, uh, built-in, in the project, when we develop this project, we have to build in a certain um, cottage industry in the community so that at least when you uh, commission this system, uh, we have something uh, that the community can uh, you know, increase or do something like um, run a small workshop, uh, welding and so on. So apart from just looking at after the machine, they can also do a lot uh, things by having this uh, opportunity to have electricity, they can run uh, welding sets and they can do fabrication of many, many agricultural tools. And uh, uh, so we don't waste the, uh, the skills that we have in the community uh, after we, tra we train these technicians. So at least they can create their own jobs uh, on this. Even though the number of jobs we can create is quite limited, but if we can uh, you know, develop larger systems than this, I think it's a real game changer. Great. Well, what I'm going to do next is um, is go to Jade and ask her the same question. Thank you for explaining that and telling um, telling especially about the fact that they're paid a monthly salary. I think that's very interesting. Um, so, Jade, hi. Are you there on the line? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that same question. You know, um, how do you guys cope with that, and and how have you uh, how have you ensured you know kind of continuity um, within your organization? Well, um, as what uh, uh, Sergey had said a while ago, um, we create a, a job opportunity to the community. So um, we also ensure that uh, five uh, five operators from the community will undergo to the training so that in case that one of them will go to to find another job in in the in the in the city then the, there's another four left to do the operation of the system and um also uh um we we don't experience any you know any problem on that because uh until now, the operators that we train in the center is still uh, still there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Jade. And so next, I wanted to go to um, to Gerhard. Gerhard, we yes. have an audience question. I mean, you're welcome to answer that question as well if you like. Um, yeah. Would you like to to answer that one, or would you like me to ask you a different one? Oh, the one which, yeah, okay, I can somehow confirm what they said. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, of course, you cannot avoid that good people go to town. Huh? And the best thing is to make an incentive for them to stay. Huh? And giving job opportunity, like uh, even maybe they need a local electrician, so this guy can make the house wiring, maybe having a small shop of uh, things. Uh, electrical appliances or whatsoever so that is a creativity problem but often they go and if there is no redundancy in the in the training of course uh, they the next one 
is not uh, properly trained. Huh? What we promote, propose, propose but cannot succeed is that uh, if it's government project, that there's a regular training for new uh, uh, operators huh? to upgrade, so bring them together, which uh, actually did not really happen. Huh? When we set up HICOM, we thought, okay, that could be a market, but it's very hard to get the financing. Uh, sometimes operators are drained from the ministry and uh, replacements as well. But definitely that's an issue. Huh? So uh, even an operator every two, three years could go to an experience exchange and so on, and such a training center would be very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. So now I'd like to go back to Lance. Hi, Lance. Are you there? Hi. Uh, yes, Miss Molly, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so what I wanted to um, to ask you is also, you know, since this is the HPNet webinar, um, and all of the people speaking today, I believe, are are members of the of the HPNet network. Um, so I wanted to understand a little bit about HPNet's work, you know, um, and especially, for example, how do you um, plan to support local training centers for micro and mini hydro going forward? What else needs to be done? Ah, yes, yes, that's a very good question. So um, currently uh, for us in uh, HPNet, we are actively helping training centers to advance their work by connecting them to interested individuals and organizations, entities who, who want or who could benefit from the services that they provide. And likewise, we help centers to access the needed support so that they can upgrade or improve their facilities. So, uh, for example, Recently, just here, uh, through the initiative of our um, our network manager, Ms. Dipti, we organ we were able to organize a roundtable in Myanmar uh, that aim that was able to connect local MHP practitioners with uh, various development partners and um, social impact investors and even local banks who could provide uh, the financing. Uh, and um, as I mentioned uh, a while ago, now similarly, we are also helping other development-oriented organizations who are just setting up their own, who are just beginning to set up their own centers to access the required knowledge, uh, resources, and uh, expertise. So, uh, uh, moreover, it would be very nice as well. It would be great if uh, HPNet could conduct the trainings, uh, the similar trainings as was done in the 90s with our member centers now. It is something that we are also working on, but uh, for this we would need funding. But more than that, uh, we would need stakeholders, especially donors, to understand that the sustainability of mini grids, micro hydropower systems are really truly heavily dependent on the capacities of local people on the ground. So yes, that that's that's how that's our um, our strategies. Those are our strategies for uh, uh, HPNet. Hello. Sorry, Lance. Sorry, I had myself on mute there. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, no. Thank you very much for closing on those very important points because it circles back to all three presentations and that really the emphasis, um, not just on technology but on the people behind the technology. That's something that at least for me came across very strongly today. Um, and. If it's possible, could we go back to the slide about HPNet's upcoming webinars? I just want to remind the audience of um, when the next one will be and what the topic will be. Um, so the next one is going to be in June. 
Um, and that is going to be mini grid sustainability, transitioning to enterprise based micro hydro power. So some of these um, kind of hints that I think you already heard in the, in the presentations today about how important um, it is to have productive uses and to have local income and jobs and this sort of thing. I think um, we'll, we'll probably be able to go even more into depth on that um, in June. So in just a few months, um, we'll be excited to bring that next one in the series to you. And of course, webinars three and four will be coming up in the autumn um, and the winter of 2019. And um, so I want to thank all of our um, presenters for being here with us today. I want to say a very big thank you as well to both of the sponsors of the webinar. Um, that's Visions, visions.net, and I've put that in the comments, um, and also energypedia.info. Um, so thank you both for, um, for supporting this very, very compelling webinar today um, with all of these experts from across Southeast Asia. Um, so thank you, um, thank you, Ms. Jade, for being with us here today. Thank you also, Mr. Gerhard, uh, Senator Lassenbang. Thank you for um, also to uh, to Lanz Habla and to Dipti Vagela for organizing it. Um, it's been a really uh, excellent experience for me, and I hope for the audience as well. So we will look forward to welcoming you to another webinar in the future. Um, Lance, would you like to say any closing words? Uh, yes. Um, uh, one last uh, a message for all. Um, please stay tuned. Watch out for our newsletter. We will be releasing it to all subscribers uh, at the end of March. So there we, you will be able to uh, see all the updates regarding the network and all, all the work that has been done so far in the year. And of course, uh, plans, our plans for the rest of the year. So thank you, thank you all. Well, that's excellent. And I've just dropped that into the, the chat. So that's uh, hpnet.org, subscribe. You just scroll down to the very bottom um, and you'll be able to uh, just pop in your email address and subscribe to their list and make sure that you get the updates on all the future webinars. Um, and of course, it's there on the slide as well. So, <laughs> so in any case, I'm multitasking here. So thank you for everyone for being here with us today. Um, it's been a real um, pleasure to have you all here with us. I just take everyone off of mute um, just in case you want to say uh, say a few words or, or say thank you. Um, but thank you for, for all being here today. It was really a, a pleasure to hear about your experiences. Thank you, Molly. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So it's amazing oh. how you can make webinars over the world, and <laughs> not knowing where people are. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We'll look forward to the next one in June. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye. 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 bye.